This morning, the House Administration Committee looked at mail delivery to the U.S. Capitol in the wake of the anthrax mailings. Members heard from the chief administrative officer of the U.S. House and postal officials about what happens to mail headed for the Capitol. Since the anthrax-laced letters last October, all congressional mail has gone through a facility in New Jersey for irradiation. The committee will come to uh, order. Today, the Committee on House Administration is holding an oversight hearing on congressional mail delivery in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, there will be members that will be uh, coming in and out during this, uh, this uh, uh, hearing. And uh, with us today is Congressman uh, Doolittle of California and the ranking member, uh, Mr. Steny Hoyer of Maryland, is uh, on his way. I'll go ahead and uh, begin just with a, a brief opening statement that I have. Uh, today, of course, is May 8, 2002. It's been almost eight months since the devastating attacks of September the 11th, 2001. It's also been about seven months since mail delivery to the House of Representatives ceased and our buildings were evacuated as a result of the anthrax that was introduced into our mail system. We all recognize that as a result of these attacks, things will never be quite the same. We're now all forced to look at uh, what has become routine processes with new eyes. Assumptions about the way we conduct business in the House of Representatives have also changed forever. I'm sure that all of us here today recognize that reality. Let me also uh, be clear as we begin the hearing today that the efforts of so many uh, of individuals in this room and throughout our process, both, both in the House of Representatives and more broadly, also uh, for many people with the Postal Service as well as the private sector, uh, they, you all have worked tirelessly to respond to the new security realities to ensure the essential functions such as our mail delivery system continue to exist. In particular, I want to thank uh, our CAO, uh, Jay Egan, and his staff who uh, had to take a mail delivery process that had evaporated, it had worked well, and they had to completely reinvent the system to accommodate the concerns which we are now faced with. We recognize what you and your staff have done, and the House deeply uh, appreciates that. Uh, however, as we all uh, convene here, there's a reason we're convening here today, and I got a report that regardless of, of all the efforts, the current mail delivery process is most certainly not meeting uh, the critical needs of the members of the House, our constituents, or the public at large due to the, the time frame from when it uh, gets into the hands of the offices. And I think we all know that that has to change. Uh, if we've been doing our best, we've now got to get our heads together and, and do better. The current state of mail delivery in the House uh, is simply uh, got to be put on a faster uh, path. Uh, I applaud also the patience of the members of the House of Representatives and our constituents across the country as we've worked to per perfect the process. Our patience, of course, is starting to wear thin. If you talk to members, <laughs> and I'm sure Mr. Doolittle and other members will have some comments about that. We've had seven months of goodwill, and now we've got to get some more results. The past 10 days, the committees received the mail that was postmarked uh, from the months of, of October. I actually brought a couple of pieces today. I'm told these are being sold on eBay, by the way, irradiated mail by our office. But I've got a couple pieces of mail, and they are postmarked in December, and, and uh, our postmark in here is May, May the 3rd on those, on those pieces. The other problem, too, is a lot of members receive uh, invitations to events that are important to the constituents that invite us, and information about urgent constituent matters which have occurred, or bills or invoices which have become months delinquent. Those communications are critical. There's also constituents who send us, obviously, some very important information, and they have a problem with Social Security or some other uh, nature of a problem and need a response. People have talked about computers, not everybody in the hinterland. Uh, has access to a computer, frankly. Otherwise, we could all email each other. Reality across the nation is not everybody has an email system, so the mail is important. So I suggest that we need to think outside the box today for different solutions. Maybe we need to think in terms of reinvention rather than simply modification. I'll leave that to the experts. But whatever it is, we've got to push ourselves to solve this problem to do it quickly. I know here at the Committee on House Administration, with the help of our uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Egan, we're in the process of exploring digitization of the mail as an alternative to our current process, which may prove to be a viable solution as we move into the future. We're determined to have a digitized mail pilot program 
uh, in place soon, speaking at least uh, on behalf of myself. But full implementation of such an alternative means of mail delivery is still months away, and we can't afford to continue to do business as we are until that time. We're very anxious to hear again from our witnesses, so I'll close at this time. Before I do, I want to remind our witnesses today that certain details related to the subject matter of this hearing on mail process may have security implications. As a result, it is necessary to ask that all participants uh, exercise discretion as to specific procedural details or facts that you may <coughs> offer as both part of your testimony in response to questions that may be asked of you during the hearing. This is a public hearing. As much, I ask you to keep uh, this concern in mind. And with that, uh, I want to turn uh, to my colleagues and uh, see if anybody else has an opening statement. I have no opening statement, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the uh, testimony. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds? Mr. Chairman, I have no opening statements as well. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to uh, move on to the uh, testimony. Uh, giving testimony will be Jay Egan, our uh, Chief Administrative Officer of the House of Representatives. Also attending and available to answer questions will be Carl Johnson, Senior Account Manager of Pitney Bowes. And also giving testimony, Sylvester Black, Manager of Capital Metro Operations, and that would be United States Postal Service. Also attending and available to answer questions will be Michael Cronin, Manager of Operations Support of the uh, Capital Metro. And with that, we'll start with Mr. Egan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Doolittle, Mr. Reynolds. With me today is Carl Johnson, as the Chairman indicated, from Pitney Bowes Management Services. Mr. Johnson is the on-site manager for the House Mail Operations. I'm pleased to be able to provide you with information and answer your questions concerning the mail processing operation at the House. With my testimony, I intend to cover the following issues. First, an overview of the House mail delivery process prior to the anthrax attack. Secondly, what the House mail system encountered last fall and during recovery, as well as what decisions were made and when. Third, the current mail delivery process for the Postal Service and Pitney Bowes here at the House. Fourth, actual results of this new mail delivery process, both for the Postal Service and for Pitney Bowes here at the House, including results of numerous field tests of those processes. And finally, our plans for the future. Prior to the anthrax discovery in the House and Senate buildings in October of last year, the U.S. Postal Service and the House mail operation was focused solely on speed and accuracy. Of course, mail was x-rayed for bombs and protected from theft, but these precautions did not significantly add to the processing time. Since October, two additional factors have been added, sterilization of the mail and quarantine storage of the mail until it can be delivered. Con concerns about biological contaminants in the mail, including anthrax and other pathogens, resulted in significant changes in the mail delivery process at the House. All the incoming, outgoing, and internal mail processes for the House, with the exception of postal windows, have been handled by Pitney Bowes Management Services since February 1996. Pitney Bowes processes U.S. Postal Service mail, including first-class letters and flats, third-class mail, packages, and registered mail, Packages from shippers other than U.S. Postal Service, and by that I mean Federal Express or United Parcel Service, were delivered by the shippers themselves to House offices. All mail and packages were x-rayed at the U.S. Capitol Police Facility on P Street Southeast. A picture of this facility is on the charts before you. Pitney Bowes sorted all mail for the House in a location in the basement of the Ford House Office Building, and a picture of that facility is before you as well. Pitney Bowes tracked its delivery cycle times and generally delivered mail within 24 hours after it was received from the U.S. Postal Service. Before you now is a timeline for the anthrax recovery that the House experienced last fall. The House stopped all mail deliveries on Friday, October 12, 2001, as part of a new mail security screening process that included a quarantine. A letter containing anthrax spores was opened in Senator Daschle's office on Monday, October 15. The House side of the Capitol and House office buildings were then closed the following Wednesday, October 17th, to the test for the presence of anthrax. Several machines used to x-ray mail at the P Street U.S. Capitol Police facility were found to be contaminated with anthrax on October 18th. By Friday, October 19th, teams of government biohazard experts were performing environmental assessments of House office buildings and mail facilities. Anthrax contamination was found on a strapping machine in the Ford Building mail room on October 21st. Several days later, contamination was found in several member offices in this building, the Longworth Building. 
The Capitol then reopened on October 23rd, and the Cannon and Raybird buildings reopened on Thursday, October 25th. The Longworth building reopened on Monday, November 5th, except for the four member offices where contamination was found. The Ford building reopened on Friday, October 26th, but the south wing of the first floor remained closed until January 2002. And finally, the four remaining member offices in Longworth reopened in January 2002. In summary, four member offices in this building and the first floor of the Ford building were displaced for 15 weeks. The P Street offsite facility is scheduled to reopen later this month. It will have been closed for 28 weeks. Before you now is a chart that shows the mail delivery recovery process the House has gone through. Delivery of first class letters and flats, and this is a flat, it's a larger size envelope, resumed in early December of last year. Delivery of packages from local shippers resumed in mid-December, and delivery of packages from national shippers, again FedEx and UPS, resumed on a limited basis in early January 2002. This was limited to packages from known sources. A decision was made that it was no longer appropriate to conduct mail operations in an office building that houses several hundred house employees, as well as the house child care center, meaning the Ford building. This committee approved an occupancy agreement for an off-site mail processing facility on November 9, 2001. The facility is located in Capitol Heights, Maryland, and the posters before you show a picture of this facility. Since October 2001, the U.S. Postal Service has implemented additional procedures to ensure the safety of government officials and employees, including the House and Senate. Among the new safety procedures, mail is irradiated before it's delivered, delivery to federal government offices for zip codes beginning 202 through 205. Here at the House, mail and packages have been accepted back on the campus in phases. Before you is a chart that shows the mail process flow. After a citizen posts the mail item to a mailbox, the Postal Service receives all government zip code mail at its Brentwood facility in Washington, D.C. from 300 regional centers around the nation. It is packaged and shipped to Bridgeport, New Jersey for irradiation and then returned to Brentwood. At Brentwood, it is unpackaged and a 24-hour off-gassing aeration process occurs. It is then shipped to the Postal Service's V Street government mail facility where it is sorted by zip code, meaning government zip codes, and then delivered to each government agency. The Postal Service has estimated this process takes between seven and 10 days. Upon arrival at the House facility, the first class mail is clipped and it's sampled. The samples are sent to a military lab for testing that takes 72 hours. And to be clear, the testing itself takes 72 hours. The samples also have to be transported to that lab. The mail is quarantined until the results are received. Upon clearance, the mail is sorted and delivered to House offices. This process has been estimated to take between four and five business days. Packages are handled through a different process at the House. Prior to October 2001, again, packages were delivered directly to House offices by the shipper, FedEx or UPS. After October, at the request of the House, shippers held packages until the 1st of January. Following approval of a policy by this committee in December, packages from national shippers were accepted beginning in January of this year. Packages are no longer delivered by the shipper to house office offices, but are, but are being delivered by Pitney Bowes employees. Packages are also being put through a process to ensure that they are safe before being delivered to house offices. Packages from the U.S. Postal Service, differently, were accepted beginning March 24th of this year under a policy approved by this Committee on House Administration. Only packages approved by the recipient are being delivered. Overall, the volume of mail coming to the House today is considerably smaller than prior to October 2001. A 29% reduction has been seen in today's mail levels as compared to the months in 2001 prior to anthrax contamination. A 37% reduction is evident in 2002 levels when compared to the same period for, for the year 2000. Before you is a chart that shows the April mail receipt trend. Analysis of the first class mail received by the House, and this is mail that the Postal Service has indicated to the House is current mail, shows that a portion of the mail is postmarked outside of the 10-day Postal Service estimate, although recent trends do show improvement. Before you now is a chart that shows the samples for April 30th, last week. 
A sample of first-class mail delivered on April 30th shows only 12 pieces postmarked within 10 days, while more than half of the sample postmarked 60 days or longer. The average age of the postmark for April 30th was 121 days. Conversely, last Friday, May 3rd, a sample of first-class mail delivered by the Postal Service and described as current mail showed the average postmark was nine days. The House is also measuring its cycle times once the mail is delivered to the House. The turnaround is measured from the point that the envelopes arrive here at the House and delivered to the House customer. For the month of April, you'll see a chart before you that shows you a week-by-week -week progress. The total turnaround was 4.7 business days for the month of April. Looking to the future, our goal is to expedite the House mail delivery process without compromising the safety of members and staff. Methodologies we are concurrently pursuing include improvements to testing and mail sorting so that it can be delivered more quickly, and implementation of a digital mail pilot for the House, as the Chairman referenced. Focus areas for House improvement of mail processing time include pursuing an alternate lab and alternate technologies to identify contaminants without the lengthy lab process now required. Pitney Bowes is also about to begin the next phase of the off-site facility that will further automate and improve the package delivery process. In addition, the CAO is pursuing an initiative that has the potential to dramatically shrink the volume of hard mail coming into House offices. We call this initiative Digital Mail. Under this approach, mail would be received and opened at an off-site facility, and a digital copy would be made with a scanner. The digital copy would then be forwarded to House offices electronically within 24 hours of receipt. We intend to complete specifications for a pilot program by next Friday, May 17th, and immediately issue a request for bids from industry. Upon receipt of industry responses, a recommendation will be made to the committee for the pilot. The proposed digital mail solution will integrate contamination testing and safety procedures, as well as with correspondence management systems, or CMM, CMS systems, in members' offices. The selected vendor will electronically del deliver digital mail to member offices participating in the program within 24 hours of receipt and will deliver necessary originals after the three-day quarantine period. Especially when it comes to mail, I'm fre frequently asked the question, when's it going to get back to normal? I consistently respond by saying, we are not getting back to normal, we're moving forward to normal. Accelerating the mail delivery process while keeping the mail safe for members and staff is an enormous challenge. Because threats can come in many forms, and ex it's extremely difficult to trace the offender. Before you is a chart of the record of one Ted Kaczynski. You may recall that it took almost 20 years to catch the Unabomber, from his first bombing in May 1978 to his arrest in April 1996. His terrorist track record included periods of up to six years between bombings, and also up to four bombings in a single year. In 1982, cyanide was placed in Tylenol that resulted in seven deaths and led to the national recall of the medication. This intrusion led to the addition of tamper prevention seals on nearly all over-the-counter medications and vitamins, and even some food products. The perpetrator of the Tylenol poisoning has never been apprehended, and the $100,000 reward offered by Johnson & Johnson has never been claimed. In sum, the world we face was made more complex by the events of September 11th and October 2001, just as we can't bring back those who were lost in New York, at the Pentagon, or at the Brentwood Mail Facility, it's very unlikely it will return completely to old mail delivery methods. Instead, we need to aggressively improve and automate more secure solutions so that constituent and other important and time-sensitive communications are received as quickly and accurately as possible and seek new alternative means that in the long run well, may well be more effective. Speaking for myself and the employees of the CAO, we won't rest until we've accomplished that job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for your testimony and uh, refer to uh, Ranking Member uh, Mr. Steny Hoyer. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for being late. Uh, the Helsinki Commission is holding a, a hearing contemporaneously with this one and uh, the Foreign Minister of Portugal, who is now the Chairman and Office of the OSCE Min Council of Ministers, was testifying. So I apologize to all of you for being uh, late. Uh, I would like to make an opening statement, however, and I, uh, Jay, congratulate you for your excellent statement. 
Um, let me say to our witnesses, not one of us here today fails to appreciate, I think, the extraordinary circumstances that you have been forced to work under since all House mail deliveries were stopped on Friday, October 12th, and a letter containing anthrax spores were opened on the Hill. Two postal workers, of course, lost their lives as a result of the cowardly attack. Uh, many others were exposed to the hazard. Members of Congress and thousands of staff were displaced when the entire Capitol complex was temporarily shut down. I understand that the Brentwood Postal Facility is still shut down because it has not been decontaminated. As a result, some Postal Service employees are working in tents. Others who are sorting mail sent to government facilities are working out of converted warehouses on V Street, which you referred to in your testimony. I understand that the Postal Service, as well as the House mail handlers, have had to deal with a frightening and difficult set of circumstances and recognize that you're working hard and doing a good job, an outstanding job. The signs of progress uh, which you've referred to are encouraging. To paraphrase Mr. Egan's statement, uh, which he just gave, we may not be getting back to normal in processing congressional mail, but we are trying to move forward to normal. I also want to make this observation. I think every member of the committee will agree. Constituent service and timely communications are the lifeblood of public office. Show me a public official who fails to respond or, or is slow in responding to constituent needs or concerns expressed in a letter, and I'll show you someone who's not going to be here long. Uh, some may grouse about the necessity of such responsiveness, but I think it demonstrates democracy's strength. As someone, Mr. Chairman, I know you have as well, who's traveled extensively when the Iron Curtain existed and talked to literally thousands of citizens who had no thought that they could communicate with anybody in power and have anybody either listen, and certainly if they listened, they did not expect a response. A few years ago, so-called experts like to talk about the paperless office of the future. Uh, someday we may actually visualize that vision, uh, even if the paper does not get to our office. As you point out, it may be digitized uh, and get to our office, but there's going to be paperwork. Even with the ubiquity of email, fax machines, and other methods of communication, nothing gets our attention uh, more than a heartfelt written letter from a constituent. Uh, that's true whether you're a freshman member of Congress or you've been here for over 20 years. Thus, timely responsive communications to constituents is not an option. It's an obligation and one that I know almost every member embraces. In my office, I know that most of the mail we are receiving today was sent in mid-April. You went through those charts very quickly. I will ask questions when the question time comes, and I'm not sure that I fully understood as you went through, because you went through pretty quickly, uh, specifically what they were saying. Uh, but uh, we're still receiving mail that was postmarked in uh, last year, in December. Uh, Jim Moran at the legislative hearing, uh, I think Mr. Egan, I know, was there, observed that he was still getting Christmas cards, presumably mailed mid-December or later. So while I support the efforts and hard work of our witnesses here, uh, and the people you represent. I particularly want to hear your views on how we can work together to address this and other challenges that confront us. The congressional mail stream must continue to flow, however that stream manifests itself at the point of receipt. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, holding this hearing, and uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know Mr. Davis uh, had a, and indicated he wanted to say something, but he defers. Thank you, sir. I want to thank the uh, ranking member and also uh, uh, Mr. Davis. And we'll move on to uh, Mr. Black. And, and also on behalf of the Congress, I want to again uh, thank uh, United States uh, Postal Authorities and the um, postal workers. I was just in Columbus, Ohio, touring a tremendous facility uh, there. Uh, but uh, also, you know, our sympathy goes out to the individuals that lost their lives and the uh, people in the postal uh, system that continued to process the mail and, and uh, keep communications going in the United States. With that, I refer to Mr. Black. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. 
With me today is Michael Cronin, the Manager of Operations Support. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Postal Service's efforts to provide safe and timely mail service to Congress and federal agencies in the wake of last fall's bioterrorism attacks. Like many American businesses, the Postal Service was hard hit by the events of September the 11th. And like Congress, the Postal Service also suffered direct results of bioterrorism. Individually and collectively, our organization found itself tested as never before. Tragically, two of our own were taken from us when the mail was used as an instrument of terror. Yet through it all, the people of the Postal Service have maintained the world's finest postal system. Postal workers around the nation stood united and continued on their daily rounds in Lower Manhattan, in New Jersey, in Connecticut, and here in Washington, D.C., and in every location that became a potential target of this silent, insidious, and deadly attack. I am proud of each one of them, but as manager, Capital Metro, I am particularly proud of the dedication and performance of every postal employee in Washington, D.C. None have been more affected than they have. Their determination and performance through the difficult months of the fall were nothing short of heroic and represent the best of public service. I salute each and every one of them. Let me share for a moment a sense of immensity of the network that supports daily mail service for our nation. Each day, almost 680 million pieces of mail enter our system through literally millions of entry points. This mail funnels through some 335 central processing locations that in turn feed 38,000 post offices, stations, and branches that provide delivery to Americans' 138 million homes and businesses. It is a daunting and challenging proposition to protect a system so accessible and so ubiquitous against the threat of bioterrorism. However, as we have learned, the very lives and health of postal employees, the American people, their government leaders, and members of the media can be placed in jeopardy if, if we do not take the proper actions to limit the vulnerability and the extent of any future terror using the mail. When we learned that the mail stream had been used to carry anthrax, we acted quickly. Our first concern was the health of our employees and our customers. We worked closely with public health officials to address the medical needs of our employees, and we informed the public of the potential risk as they became known. We closed camp contaminated facilities, including the Brentwood Processing Facility here in Washington. We tested others, and when necessary, we cleaned them. We provided our employees with masks and gloves. We changed maintenance procedures to limit the pro potential spread of anthrax in our bu buildings. We acquired as quickly as possible the means to sanitize mail that might be tainted with anthrax. And the Postal Inspection Service joined with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies in the ongoing investigation of the crime. It was our goal to do all we could to make sure that the mail we were bringing to America's homes businesses and government officials presented no threat. Let me go over in more detail how this process has evolved with regard to mail deliveries for Congress and the federal agencies in Washington, D.C. When our test found that the Brentwood facility was contaminated, we closed it. Medication was made available to our employees and they were reassigned to other locations. Both incoming and outgoing mail was rerouted to other process facilities in both Virginia and Maryland. Working with law enforcement officials, other federal agencies, and Congress, we identified certain mail as target mail. This was the mail that could not be delivered until we were confident that it did not present a risk to the recipients. This target mail included mail addressed to Congress and federal agencies in Washington, D.C. At the same time, more than one million pieces of potentially contaminated mail was trapped in the Brentwood facility. We could not move any of this mail until we had identified and implemented a safe and efficient method of sanitizing it. We worked quickly and we worked carefully to obtain access to the technology that would do this. With the input of the best experts available, we identified irradiation as the only technology both readily available and effective in neutralizing anthrax spores from the mail. 
We contracted for irradiation services at a facility in Ohio and later at another one in New Jersey. I'd like to tell you about the irradiation process in a little more detail. Irradiation as of today represents the only process used by the Postal Service to sanitize mail. We will continue for the foreseeable future to irradiate letters, flats, and packages addressed for government agencies and the 202 to 205 zip codes. For those of us who currently receive mail within the targeted zip codes, we are preparing this mail for transportation to Bridgeport, New Jersey. There the mail undergoes irradiation. After irradiation, the mail is returned to a temporary processing site where it is sprayed with an odor neutralizer called Odor Away. This is a non-hazardous, widely available commercial product that is commonly used in hospitals. After spraying, we ventilate the, the mail for up to 24 hours before it is sorted and processed for delivery. Processed mail is then transported to the appropriate federal facility for delivery by the agency's mail unit. When we first began the irradiation of mail, only small volumes of mail were able to move through our facilities each day. But with the experience, we were able to improve our processing and treat greater volumes of mail. By the first week of February, the backlog had been eliminated. As larger amounts of mail could be treated, larger amounts of mail were made available to Congress and to federal agencies for delivery. We were able to eliminate the bottleneck of backlog, backlog mail on the processing side. Unfortunately, this meant that the mail volume received by some federal agencies and by Congress exceeded the capacity of their internal distribution operations. We stored that process treated mail until the internal recipients were able to accept it. We are no longer storing any mail for any government agency. Within the context of the new normal, with incoming mail for addressees in the zip code ranges of 202 through 205 being diverted to Bridgeport, New Jersey for sanitization, the additional transportation and processing time generally adds four to seven days to the, direct, to the regular delivery times. To this point, a number of staff members from this committee toured our temporary processing facility on Friday, May 3rd. They were were able to see that the sanitized mail being processed for delivery was generally postmarked April 26th or 27th, well within the seven to 10 days the Postmaster General told members of our oversight committee. Again, I should point out that this is only for targeted mail. All other mails for homes and businesses in the District of Columbia is being delivered normally. In fact, despite losing their primary processing and distribution center, Capital District Postal employees continue to provide mail service to the residents of Washington, D.C., near the pre-October 21st levels. We are continuing to work with manufacturers of irradiation technology to identify the best processes and protocols for handling and processing the mail both safely and efficiently. The electronic beam systems we purchase will be deployed in a configuration optimized for mail. This limited deployment will allow us to accurately evaluate the operational impacts, costs, and effects on mail and its contents. The Postal Service has an obligation and the privilege of providing every American in every community with safe, universal access to a system of affordable, dependable mail service. The people on our, of our nation rely on the mail. They welcome it. They trust it. We cannot let that change. After all, the Postal Service alone among carriers is a vital public service provided to them by their government. It is crucial that we maintain our national infrastructure so we can continue to protect that trust for all users, urban and rural, rich and poor, business and consumer, private citizen and public servant. This is the promise of universal service and it is the only reason that the Postal Service exists. Mr. Chairman, let me again express my gratitude for the congressional assistance we have received to protect the nation's postal system from bioterrorism. We look forward to your support and leadership and that of every member of this committee as the Postal Service continues its essential work of binding this great nation together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be happy to answer any questions. I want to thank the uh, gentleman for his testimony. Um, 
On Monday of this week, the House Inspector General documented that over 17 percent of the mail received at our Capitol Heights mail facility had postmarks dating from March of this year or earlier. Based on the mail volume uh, for the day, this means over 3,000 pieces didn't meet that 7 to 10 day performance standard that the uh, United States Postal Service has indicated that is being met. Of this mail, nearly 10 percent or approximately 1,600 pieces had postmarks from last year. So I just wanted to see you know, the consistency with the information um, that all the backlog mail has been processed through the system. So I, I'm wondering, you know, has it all been processed through the system, the backlog mail, and where would the old mail be coming from? Okay, there are several avenues. One, our backlog, there is no backlog in our possession. But what's happened is that there is a hygiene, an address hygiene problem with the zip codes of 202 to 205. And we have um, a high, a high uh, address hygiene as far as machines reading it, uh, oh, okay. uh, addresses not being uh, consistent with the rest of mm -hmm. America, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, uh, congressmen, and that's it, Washington, D.C. Uh, there, there are issues that we've always encountered. In fact, when Brentwood was up, we had what was what we call a government mails unit within the Brentwood facility. And in that unit, what we did was take a lot of human oversight to make sure that the mail was properly addressed or properly given to the right unit. Um, the other thing that's, that's compounding everything today is that a lot of the agencies were or what we call, this constitutes a loop mail situation where mail kind of goes to the wrong place and it has to be reintroduced back into the system. Well, what happens if, if all the other agencies that receive missent mail, if they're not diligent in reintroducing it back into the system, you do see tails. You see mail with long days of delivery. So the 3,000 the 3, pieces that didn't meet the 7 to 10 day could be pieces then you're saying that were uh, misdelivered. Mis misdelivered or didn't or, have particular correct addresses or yes sir and, and that would account for the 3,000 well it would, would account for some of it and then the some I think uh, mr. Egan would probably tell you that we're not quite current here either with all the backlog of mail that that we've turned over I believe the reference that the chairman had was to the current mail delivery truck is so what the IG was sampling mm -hmm. yesterday and today was what the Postal Service has characterized to us as current mail. Okay. It's not sampling uh, other categories of mail. Current mail. And that's and you mentioned the loop. Twenty percent of the mail is in, is in a loop. Is that what? Um, no, I'm not sure of, of what exact okay. percentage, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I think, Mr. Chairman, just to supplement, uh, in terms of what the member office sees versus the statistics that you were referring to, mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's probably uh, three explanations for what a member sees. And I, for example, I have statistics for Mr. Hoyer's office for yesterday for what your mail was. Uh, we have three mail deliveries uh, in the morning, the 9 o'clock delivery, you got uh, six pieces of mail, according to my statistics. Four were April postmarks. One was November, one was January. In the uh, mid-morning delivery, you got 11 letters, uh, 10 were April postmarks, one was January. And then in the afternoon, the 2.30 delivery, you got uh, a total of nine items. Five were April postmarks, three were <coughs> December, and one was October. Um, what we're seeing on our side of things is I, I just have three reasons for delays. The October guy is really ticked at me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, one is, as I explained in my testimony, we consciously and brought the mail back to campus in phases. Uh, we did so for security reasons, and we did so for capacity reasons. Again. The Ford mailroom was lost. The P Street facility is still closed. Uh, we sent a proposal to the committee uh, on November 9th, three weeks after the anthrax, for leasing of a new facility in Capitol Heights, Maryland. But that internal, that was an empty warehouse. We had to rebuild all the capacity inside that building. 
So we brought it back in phases. The last phase of approval was for Postal <coughs> Service packages on March 24th, a little over a month ago. There's naturally a backlog built up behind that, both for the Postal Service, who was holding it for us, and then when we received those trailers from the Postal Service. And we've been working that <coughs> backlog off. Secondly, there are some categories of items where we made a conscious decision in consultation with uh, personnel of the committee and talking to member offices, items like old newspapers and periodicals. People said, we're not in a rush to get those. Make the priority the current stuff, the current first class mail. So in some cases, especially with regard to old periodicals and magazines, we've been feeding those in over time. And so that would sometimes identify when a member gets older things. We've been feeding those in slowly, instead prioritizing the first class mail. And then thirdly, definitely our statistics are showing for what the Postal Service says is current mail. There is a portion of that mail that does have older postmarks, significantly older postmarks in some cases, and I, I can't really offer an explanation for that. Well, I, I just wanted to, you know, I've got two perfectly addressed letters here, and uh, they're to Jeff Janice, and they're here in the uh, Longworth uh, building. One is postmarked December 12th. The other is February 5th, and they came in May the 3rd. So also I looked down in our office, our personal office, I've been watching the postmarks, and it was pretty consistent. Now, it might have changed this week, but last week, if mail came in, it was the 18th of, I think it was um, March, and I received it last Friday. It was consistently, the next day would be the 19th of March, and I would receive it. It was consistently one month. So. Somewhere along the line, there's, I mean, we say the backlog's done, but it, it can't be done if this is, if this is coming in. I, I mean, I've got these two letters perfectly marked, so if it's missed delivery, that would be a problem. The, uh, and I think that's what members are, are, are seeing that, and so we wonder when does the backlog get cleared up. We also stopped, isn't it correct, we stopped using the Ohio Lima facility. Now, I was told, I think that was around the 11th of April. I was told we stopped using the Lima, Ohio facility. We went everything New Jersey because there was no more backlog. But I think th there's got to be a backlog somewhere. Otherwise, these, I mean, can anybody answer that? And I'll move on for other Mr. members. Mr. Chairman, before they answer, let me just make an observation. I'm just told in our office this morning, uh, we've got two 2001 letters or communications, whatever they were. Perfectly addressed. Perfectly addressed. I think there's a question pending. I just added to the example. And, and, and the barcodes aren't blacked out, which if it's, they do that for loop mail, they'll. Yes. And these aren't blackened out, which meant that they work. And uh, so any answers to questions other members have? We were, in, apparently both letters were in the same position. Jim? I, I think repetition is important here because it demonstrates the magnitude and consistency. I have had the same experience you have. This is mail that just came in. It's dated December. It's appropriately addressed. And my concern also is the level of confidence people have in writing to us. I've seen your statistics on how much the mail has dwindled. And if I were a regular person out there writing my representative, I wouldn't have as much confidence in how much impact the mail was going to have. And that is something that's difficult to cure over time. So my question, which they've asked as well, is uh, is there anything we're not doing that we could be doing to take care of this backlog of that type of mail? And are there any tools we need to give to you that you don't already have that would help you do more with respect to the backlog? Anybody like to answer that? Or any volunteers? I guess I want to be clear that as far as the House is concerned, with regard to first-class mail, we don't have a backlog. Jay, that means when you say we don't have a backlog, I mean, what, what does that mean? We are processing the current first-class mail right into the 4.7-day cycle time. Of once you receive it? Once we receive it. That is the current state of the House mail operations for first class mail and flats. So no matter what, just to make, make this clear, no matter what the date was that you received it, in other words, if, if you received this and the date was December 12th, but you received it, this took four days to cycle to us, is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman. Mr. Doolittle, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Doolo, absolutely. But before when you, you receive it, does it go through like a 10-day sanitation cycle or something? I mean, is that in there? Not at the house. Right, but before it gets, all the mail before it gets into your 4.7-day cycle goes through a very prolonged process as well, right? And that's how many days? It, it adds four to seven days, so we could safely say it adds 10 days to the process. Okay, so 10 days plus 4.7. Right. Okay. So, no, Mr. Chairman. It's a, um, excuse I'm sorry, me. Mr. Fidel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh, subject matter of, uh, I used to serve uh, as the ranking Democrat on postal affairs, so uh, unfortunately I know a little bit about this subject. I, I want to just make one thing clear, because I've heard a number of the comments, and I know what my colleagues are talking about, and I don't want it to be mischaracterized. None of us want you to do anything that would not provide safe uh, and safety to the members and staff here, notwithstanding any impatience about the delivery of the mail. So, and I, and I want to compliment all that has been done, both internally uh, and through the U.S. Uh, Postal Service to deal with what has been a major a concern uh, in terms of uh, the anthrax um, uh, situation. And, but the, the, the issues in relationship to, to uh, mail delivery to these zip codes here in D.C. are complicated issues. And um, I think what you're saying to us is that in terms of once the once, once we get possession of the mail here, that you are delivering it within the timetable. And the, the question is what the post office is doing in terms of your timetable. And if you're saying it adds 10 days, is that with the closing of the Ohio facility? Um, is that shorten the time, lengthen the time? And, you know, are there other things that we can do to help expedite it? But again, none of this is... Uh, is a desire for you to cut any corners anywhere, because I'd rather not get any of the mail if it was going to jeopardize some of my staff or my colleagues and their health. Uh, you know, we can, you know, we can, and I'm sure I speak to all of my colleagues that that's not our, you know, that's not what we, we're not trying to push for corners to be cut. We just want to make sure that to the degree that people can send us a letter, hopefully in a, um, in a way in which, you know, um, it's safe, and that you can get it to us in a reasonable amount of time. And, uh, and I just want to put that on the record, Mr. Chairman, because I don't want the press to misconstrue the comments and the conversation that's taken place uh, by the, the chairman and, and the ranking member and others about, their, about your concerns. I'm just, uh, I've got a couple questions, and I'll yield to the rest of the members. I just want to also follow back with this, and, and uh, we want, uh, obviously, safety for your staff, our staff of the House. Uh, I think we're trying to, in my mind, I'm trying to get down to a point, and a question I want to ask to, to get that is, in the most ideal situation, and we know we have one facility irradiating now, if I mail a letter today from you know, my home in St. Clairsville, Ohio, to myself here in the Capitol, what is the maximum amount of time going through the normal, safe process that I will get that letter, and I'd like to hear from both of you. Okay. From the Postal Service's viewpoint or standpoint, we're saying seven to ten days. Now, that letter from Ohio would go in our logistics network and be delivered to the Washington, D.C. area. In the Washington, D.C. area, we're massing the mail for zip codes 202 to 205 to be sent to Bridgeport, New Jersey for sanitization. So those trucks are leaving Monday through Friday, taking mail to Bridgeport to be irradiated. Um, the process is adding. If uh, I would believe Ohio would probably be in our two days, two days. Two day standard. So it would be uh, two days anyway. So we think that what we're saying is that the addition is a day here, a day to, to get to Bridgeport, a day back, process, and then we turn it over to the House mail unit. Okay, and then that adds 4.7 days. That's been our track record to date. So I that guess... Factor in, of course, that there's no mail deliveries in the House on Saturdays and Sundays. Right. So there's another potential yes. 
two days mm -hmm. that are going to be factored in depending on when that cycle hits. The mail is all delivered by truck. It's not flown, correct? Correct. Correct. Delivered by truck, okay, because the cost of flying would be prohibitive, I, w I would assume. Uh, then let me ask a qu uh, another question. It, if we brought a, a radiation machine here, on, you know, off-site somewhere, how many days would that process take if I mailed a letter from Ohio to myself here? Right. Theoretically, it would cut out our transportation or the bulk of our transportation time. So it would probably shave a day to two days off the process. Right. Okay. okay. So we would still look then, if it's a day to two days, we would still be looking at eight days and you're 4.7. Right. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is no matter what we do, no matter what we do, if we put that machine across the street, we're going to have eight to ten days, or no, we're going to have 12 days to get our mail. Is that the correct assumption, no matter what we do? I think there's opportunity, but it's months, if not a year away, the scientists and research folks are telling us that they think that there's good reason to believe that uh, the sampling that presently takes 72 hours, the testing that takes 72 hours, could be cut to 24 hours. But that's not immediately at hand. Now, with digitization, though, as I understand it, from talking to several uh, companies, at least five or six, that mail could be taken from Brentwood, delivered to the digitization company, and that mail could be up uh, within a, a two-day period, I guess, is it safe to say, online for members to access, as I understand it. And, I, and that's one of the reasons I think that, at least from my perspective, we need to, to look at that as a two-day uh, service. Well, would you yield for a question? Yes. Um, so. Under the digitization proposal, they wouldn't go through all of this sanitation process? We would. It would still have to go through our, at least our plans now, is that mail would still go through the irradiation process for the Postal Service. But wonder if, wonder, let me ask this question, wonder if the, the companies say, give me the mail. Just give me the mail, you don't have to do anything with it, we'll take care of it at our end, and they would have something safe and secure because they don't want to obviously have their employees or their business go under. Now, if that happened, then that's direct mail delivery, right? If, if that scenario is possible. Otherwise, you would have to still irradiate the mail and then give it to a company to digitize it. You'd still be looking about 11 days, I guess, I assume. Do you have a, Ms. Yeah, that, uh, Mr. Chairman, just one cost factor to that, of course, that the Postal Service is encumbering the cost of the irradiation, and if we were to pay for that kind of solution, then the House would probably have to cover that overhead of the irradiation <coughs> part of the process. Uh, if we gave it to a digital company? Yes. Uh, Assuming that they would do the sterilization before they digitized it. Mm -hmm. It would be all, yeah, it would be in the cost of... Exactly. And right now, the, the post office is, is encumbering the radiation. That's correct. You don't want to bill us? We would like to. I, I figured it. <laughs> I figured it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to go back to what I was describing as the backlog issue and be more specific. It seems to me there is some mail, and it's still happening, that I would describe as uh, 2001 mail. Um, the Christmas card is probably the best illustration. And I just want to understand from you all, where is that bottleneck exist? Is, is it part of the process at the United States Postal Service? Is it here, Jay, inside the House office building? Uh, and are we doing everything we can possibly do to get this December 2001 mail and the like into our hands as quickly as possible? And do you have all the tools you need to do that? Yes, I think we do have the tools. Again, as I, I explained earlier, there is a portion of mail that because of the policies that we've adopted came to us in large bulk quantities. At this point in time, that is almost exclusively packages and periodicals. The first class mail is now current at the house and the portion that there is a portion that comes in that is described as current mail that has those kind of postmarks on it. 
Well, that's my question is with respect to this big quantity of mail that's sitting out there, which is not entirely His perspective is to some of which is first class mail. What is the process we are using for getting that into the offices as quickly as possible? Because obviously it's still coming in. It's dribbling and drabbling in. With the gentleman, you, gentleman, you, I, I just wanted to show you this just was handed to us. And this is from uh, Congressman Charles Taylor, who's chairman, as you know, of the Appropriations Subcommittee. And these are just an entire batch he just received. And these are from his district, and they're, they're dated February and December. And they got an extreme amount of this today, which I just want to restate here. This is what's what's but, happening. But if I understand, maybe asking the question to the wrong. You're just saying in terms of when you get it here in the House, it's current in terms of this four-day delivery. Now, when you get it, it could be six months old, but you're delivering it within 4.7 days, right? I, I am saying that the, the trucks that come to us on a daily basis from the Postal Service are described to us as current. Current mail, and you are getting it to members with be, under five days under right. your current scenario. But it has nothing to do with when the mail was actually sent, which the comment there has to do with the fact that there could be, it could be mail from a very long time ago, depending on how lost it was in the system or in the loop or whatever. But that is not a problem with the house. It may be a problem with the, mm -hmm. the postal service. But in, tr in terms of the house and, and the, the chief administrator's office, you're delivering at a current pace, except for these old periodicals. Periodicals and away. packages. Yeah. Which you, but anyway, so I, I mean, so I guess the question then is directed to Mr. Black with the United States Postal Service. Do you have a huge quantity of mail? And we know how challenging your job is, and you're still playing catch up. Uh, that you are going through to get to Mr. Egan in the House of Representatives. I'm mean, again, I'm referring to these first class letters from December. Um, what is the process you're using from a timing standpoint, and what can we do to help speed up that process? Well, sir, the issue is, and, and being respectful to Mr. Egan, is that three weeks ago, we gave them 15 trailers of mail that dated back to January that we had sealed as early as January, which really put us in the heart of the dilemma that we're, that we've currently are going through. I don't think that our protocol was good enough that that mail was segregated, that it was only periodicals or only bulk business. I, I think that what we're gonna find is that when those trailers are completely worked down and we get the rest of the Christmas cards and the October mail that's commingled in there, I, I think once we work through that, I think that we're gonna find that a lot of this old mail is gonna disappear. We currently have no backlog trailers at all in postal service possession. And, and it's not all Again, if you take that statement on face value, what it's saying is that what we get in today goes out today. Now, the problem being is that if uh, the Office of Social Security discovers that they've got a container of mail that's been sitting in their basement for six months, they can reintroduce that mail back into the system. And they could have a container of mail that's been there for six months that doesn't belong to them because of some of the things you're seeing on the carts. Every letter that you see where they block out the barcode is a mistake. It's a mistake. And what we have to do, the only way, because of, of the great strides we've made in automation with our equipment, there are fewer and fewer hands that touch the mail. So it's conceivable. And where our biggest mistake was in this entire process Early on, we trusted everything to automation. So it's conceivable that in January, uh, December, November, that a piece of mail could have been re-irradiated multiple times if a human being did not go through and catch that. And that's what we've concentrated on since uh, March, March 
the first of March, where we actually put people back in the process so we can go through. Everyone you see crossed out is crossed out by a person that says, this is loop mail, it either misread on the automation or was directed to the wrong place. So we're, we've concentrated on cutting down, but we can only do that if it's reintroduced back into the system. For, so, if I could just for one, th this mail that I've got, Mr. Taylor's and mine and yours, none of us blackened out on the barcodes. And uh, so, I mean, I just wanted to stress that. If it was all blackened out, we would know it was right. you know, misdirected mail. Mr. Hoyer. Jay, I, uh, I understand it takes 4.7 days, of which three days or two plus days, uh, very close to three is the uh, airing out and uh, detection process. Right. If, that, if we treated the mail that was delivered to us from the post office as okay, how long would it take under those circumstances to get to the member's office? I would estimate 24 to 36 hours if you eliminated the sampling and testing process. So we're looking at 1 to 1.5 days for in-house handling of mail. And the additional 3.2 days is attributable to airing out, testing at Fort Detrick, uh, and receiving, uh, in effect, a clearance. I'm not airing it out, sir, the testing solely. It's sampled, put in quarantine until the lab results come back. All right. Um, now, Mr. Black, I've talked to Mr. Potter, to uh, General Potter and others. Uh, obviously, one of the issues here is that we are receiving literally millions of pieces of mail. Uh, we have, of course, identified no anthrax, as I understand it, since October. Am I correct? Correct. Uh, so that we are incurring an extraordinarily high cost for, uh, in effect, processing, sanitizing, and testing clean mail. Uh, now, I, I agree with Mr. Fatah. That's very nice to say, you know, we only got four letters and they c killed two people uh, at uh, the Postal Service, Mr. Curzine and Mr. Morris. Uh, and, and I want to say something. I was one of those, I don't know how many of you did, went down to D.C. General Hospital with a lot of folks that were in line from the Postal Service from Brentwood waiting to get either advice and counsel or medication. Uh, and they showed extraordinary courage and resolve. Uh, I didn't speak to one person, and I must have spoken to over 100 people uh, on two days that I visited down there and walked the line and talked to the doctors and talked to the medical personnel that were receiving them. I didn't talk to anybody who uh, said that they weren't going to stay uh, on the job with the Postal Service. They weren't interested in going back to Brentwood, obviously, and we weren't letting them go back to Brentwood. But they were, they were determined to uh, do their jobs. In talking to General uh, Potter, clearly, if we can get to the technology that will detect prior to going through this entire process, that's where we want to get. So that we have, in other words, some technology at some, you have said 300 and some odd central points, because we got millions, and so we couldn't deploy the technology in the box or in the slot. That would not be a practical uh, way to do it. But it seems to me that the way ultimately we're going to have to get at this, assuming we continue to have mail, is to have a technology that detects at the, at the end time as opposed to <coughs> processing millions of pieces of mail that have not been found to have anything wrong with them. Uh, can you tell me, Mr. Black, uh, maybe you're not the proper person to answer this, but where we are on the quest for that uh, detection technology at input as opposed to processing through the, uh, as, as I'm sure most of the members of the committee uh, I don't know whether it was Mr. Kersine or Mr. Morris, he was standing at a door away from the machinery. What we presume happened, am I correct, Mr. Black, that at the point in time the mail was squeezed, the spores came out, the door was open, and there was an outdraft. 
And he was in the outdraft and obviously took a breath at this point in time. That is how estranged he was from the, the particular letter that was infected with the spores. So, I mean, obviously this is a extraordinarily virulent and dangerous material. So, Mr. Fattah is right. We all want to be careful for everybody who works for us and, and forget about the members. They, you know, they can take the risk, but I mean, the, I've got young people in my office who open mail and handle it and transmit it to me. Uh, but where are we on the on the technology of detection? Well, unfortunately, Congressman, I'm not the one to ask. I, I presume that. I, right. My, my uh, uh, pipeline to the postal gurus, of course, is sitting behind you, Mr. King. My, uh, Mitch uh, tries to keep all of us informed. Uh, I don't know whether he has any information on that, but, Mr. Chairman, it seems to me that we, we really need to focus on the research dollars for detection capability, because if, if, if at the 338 or 40 central centers from these millions of entry points can detect at that point in time uh, what we presume is going to be an extraordinarily tiny, tiny percentage of possibly infected mail, we can handle 99.9999 percent of the mail in a, in a fashion that will get to that 24 to 36 hour turnaround at our facility and do the uh, two or three day delivery of which Mr. Black talks. The Postal Department, Mr. Chairman, has gone from for first class mail uh, throughout the United States in the last eight to nine years from somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 80 percent on time delivery to where now they are consistently throughout the country. In my district, they're at 95 percent on time delivery of first class mail. They've done an extraordinary job in, in facilitating the flow of mail in a timely fashion. This anthrax thing kicked everybody in the head. Uh, and uh, so to get back to that extraordinary performance, we need to find out at the input level, not at the processing and output level, which is what we're now doing, at the input level where the danger exists. I, I know you got a note from Mitch King, but. Right. And we could have Tom Day, our Vice President of Engineering. There are some pilots going on, and he would be the one that's uh, knowledgeable enough to, to tell us how that's working. They are doing some testing. Jay, and then I'm going to let others have questions because I went on too long, but do you have any comment on that? And have we looked at that? Are we talking? I know it's a postal department responsibility. And, and by the way, uh, you talked about billing us. I frankly think it's the federal government's responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, make the Postal Department whole for the extraordinary costs that they've incurred, just as we made the airlines whole. You know, we did billions of dollars for the airlines. We need to make sure the Postal Department, through no fault of its own, uh, in, has incurred a very substantial cost, be reimbursed for that cost as a, in effect, effect of terrorism that we're going to try to compensate them for. But, Jay, do you have a thought on that? I'd just say that the, the, White, uh, the Senate and the House have both been participating in a task force that was established by the Office of Homeland Defense with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and the Postal Service is a member of that. That was the group that certified irradiation as kind of the processing solution, and that same group is remaining in place to look at the alternative science solutions, <coughs> the hope of finding them both on the front end, the middle end, and the back end. So. The challenge, though, just, just one challenge is, remember, we're, we're looking for more than anthrax. And so that testing has to be capable of looking for more threats than just what happened before. The voting bells have been called. I, I want Mr. Doolittle. I, I understand that. The detection has to be broader than anthrax. I... Mr. Doolittle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you are currently testing for more pathogens than just anthrax. That's correct. How many more? As the chairman indicated, um, we're hesitant to say. Right. Okay. Um, it's appropriate. Shouldn't say. The uh, I, I'll note too. We're getting Christmas cards every other day still in our office. Um, and the zip codes you mentioned two two zero two zero two zero five. Those include for that's the White House, the executive branch, Congress, and the judicial branch, right? Okay. Um, 
and Mr. Egan, the 4.7 days you said some one one or 1.3 or something is is due for further uh, sampling of mail. Did I understand you say that right? What I said was that uh, it's 72 hours for the testing part of that four yeah, but, to five day window. Well, but the. The post office is doing all the sterilization. Are we doing this on top of what they're doing? That's correct. And that's felt to be necessary? Yes, sir, it is, because, uh, again, we're looking for multiple pathogens. Oh, all right. You're, they're just doing it for anthrax. Well, and no, your radiation's yeah. been certified to uh, sterilize against a number of biological threats. But in the case of anthrax and some others, it doesn't remove it from the envelope. The powder would still be there. The question is whether that powder is dead or not. Okay. Um, do you have a minute to talk about the charts? Yes, sir. So uh, looking at, I'm looking at uh, this one, average elapsed time between postmark date and delivery to house offices. And this is based on all the mail or just in a sampling you've done? Sample. And so you're saying that for mail received on March, May the 6th, that was the average uh, day was 23 days, right? Correct. Okay. May I just ask about the, uh, and uh, this has been the case for some time, don't we get, each of our offices gets five mail deliveries a day, is that right? Or more? Two deliveries. Okay. Two deliveries and five pickups. Two deliveries and five pickups. Okay. And um, the two deliveries, is that because we get new shipments in uh, so that you're doing a second delivery to respond to that? Or is it just because you have to do that to deal with the volume of mail? Well, we have different deliveries that are coming in, some from the Postal Service, some from UPS, some from Federal Express, so forth and so on. We also have stuff that it's being processed through the sorting system all day long, so there's a volume to accommodate that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one more time on the backlog. First class mail, December 2001. What I understood you to say, Mr. Black, is that recently you delivered a massive quantity of such mail to Mr. Egan. So I guess my question to you, Mr. Egan, when you said earlier that you are current with the first class mail, which is a real tribute to your efforts. Does, does that exclude this backlog that was recently delivered to you of a massive quantity? We have three trailers sitting at the Southeast Federal Center that is primarily packages and periodicals. Is there anything we can do to help you more expeditiously segregate the first class mail in that and get it into the offices as quickly as possible? Well, that's, that's why we've been measuring the current deliveries. The current deliveries of first class mail go to our facility at um, Capitol Heights. And um, our understanding is that is the current mail stream and we were giving that the first priority. So it's, it already is segmented. But, but I think, but I'm asking about the mail that has been sitting there for several months now. There's That's nothing, not There's your... nothing sitting in our possession for several months. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's a conflict here in the testimony that we need to pursue further about where this backlog is and what can be done on top of everything else that's being the, done. Of the three happened? trailers that are sitting at the Southeast Federal Center, one of them was delivered the day before yesterday. But the, the other thing I'd like to add here, and, and unfortunately we're, we're running out of time, but I would, we did have, uh, it confirmed there were six trailers and now we're told there was 15, so there's other conflicts we, and we'd like to, it's a second bell. You like? I, I just want to observe, on May 6th, as I understand the figures here, 29 of the approximately 290, a little less than 290, no, about 290, or 10% were pre-2001 or 2002. Now, if we received between 15 and 18,000, I understand from Mr. Cable, May 6 was a relatively light day. If that's the case, that means there are between 1,500 and 1,800 letters per day that are 2001. Now, this is a, this is a, obviously every member therefore has examples. Uh, and I think what Mr. Davis is trying to get at is 
where have they been and where are they and how do we get to them to get rid of at least those 2001? Uh, frankly, we've advised, I think, all our constituents, look, we're not receiving mail. If you <coughs> send us a communication and you didn't get a response, email or, you know, send another letter, do whatever. A and actually, we're having a lot of mail sent to alternative locations. I presume a lot of members are doing that as well. Uh, but, uh, Jay, I think that's the consternation you're hearing. Where are these 1,800 uh, a day? Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, about 10,000 a, a week. The statistics you're quoting, I understand, are the Inspector General's sample from Monday of, yes. of the Postal Service truck as the door was opened yeah. as it arrived at Capitol Heights. No storage on the part of the house. That was when the truck arrived at the house for delivery of first class and other mail items. Right. It came from somewhere, right? It came from the Postal Service. And it was 3,000 3, pieces. Where, where are these pieces? How do we, you, you say they're in the loop. They, in Social Security, you said, for instance, found some and, and put it back in the loop. Uh, why in heaven's name did Social Security hold on to it that long? Oh, Mike, you want to take a... Um, <clears throat> yes, Congressman Hire. What we found um, as we get dug into this process is that uh, a couple things happened. Um, there was a lot of confusion around the time that we closed the Brentwood facility, and I think that perhaps some of the mailrooms around the city uh, were not aware of the fact there was a problem with mail right away and, and continued to receive mail um, or to accumulate mail in their mail rooms. What we've, d what we've seen over the last uh, six months is that from time to time, uh, almost at random, various agencies come to us and say, uh, Postal Service, we have mail in our mail room that's been there since October or November. Uh, we'd like to re-induct it in the system, um, even though you've delivered it to us, and make sure, because we don't know if it's been irradiated or not, we want to make sure it's safe. And that has been going on for a few months. So those events, when they happen, um, I can understand how the downflow of that event would be. Uh, there would be a sprinkling of old dates to various addresses within the city. But I'm only aware of, of one case where there was a very significant amount of this mail. Other than the mail that we were retrieving from P Street, um, during the period uh, February and March to reinduct in this process. Mr. Cronin, would you agree that 1,500 to 1,800 pre-2002 letters coming to this, the house itself, is a pretty large number of pieces of mail, on a, particularly when it's coming on a daily basis? Uh, we're talking about, you know, 7,500 to 10,000 a week. Yes, I would. And one of the things I noticed in the data, Congressman, is that, um, you know, we had such disparate results in the two days that where we were comparing performance, we went from 121 days in one sample to uh, something like 11 days on the, on the next sample. It raised a question in my mind, and I'm no statistician, but it raised a question in my mind about how projectable those results are. I'm saying you're saying this not this may not be an average, it may be an anomaly. I'm suggesting it may be an anomaly. However, and I know we have to go, Mr. Chairman, what the problem with it being an anomaly is that so many people talk to Mr. Ney and I and other people on this committee who happen to be getting the anomaly. <laughs> so it becomes a relatively frequent incidence of an anomaly. And we really need to have, I think, Jay, with the post office, uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, perhaps with the Speaker and Mr. Daschle, urging every government agency through the executive department to make a, a, a search uh, for any mail that may fall into this category, extricating it from its storage spot, getting it into this system, and getting this backlog, which is old mail, forget about when anybody receives it, old mail, through the system and uh, get us operating on April, May mail. You know, we have thank to, you, Mr. Chairman. We have, thank you. We have to go for the vote, but we're going to be four in a series of questions we need to put together and get a re prompt response and so we can get down to you know, the bottom of, of the issues that were raised today that weren't uh, made clear. But we uh, appreciate uh, your testimony today.
Uh, I ask unanimous consent that members and witnesses have seven legislative days to submit material into the record. And those statements and materials be entered in the appropriate place in the record. Without objection, uh, material be entered. I ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes on all matters considered by the committee at today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Having completed our business for today and hearing on congressional mail delivery, the committee is uh, adjourned. Thank you. Watching C-SPAN 2, a public service of America's cable television industry. Coming up tonight.